And so now I want to turn things over uh, to Dr. Jake Ward, who is the acting deputy director in the Office of Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chains. Again, another office in the Office of Infrastructure in the Department of Energy. We also call them MESC. If you're a MESC, that is a Manufacturing Energy Supply Chain Office. This is the office that uh, the Department of Treasury turned to to say, we want to get this right. Again, we're about getting all of these programs right. The Manufacturing Energy Supply Chains Office is absolutely a place to turn to, to understand the critical supply chains in our clean energy manufacturing sector and how we can have the right types of benefits in energy communities and not leave anybody behind. And so Jack's going to dive deeper into some of the deep, or Jake, I'm sorry, he's going to drive deeper into the details and nuances of the 48C tax credit. Uh, thank you. Morning, everyone. Um, thank you all for having us. Um, for those of us on the East Coast, and I'm, I'm actually a Pittsburgher myself, um, always a nice excuse to come out here to Colorado. A beautiful, sunshiny day with just enough snow left, but clear enough roads. So thank you all for that. Um, but really, really happy to be here. Um, thank you for always being wel welcoming. Uh, thanks also to, to Brian, to Ben, to Walt for the great opening comments. Um, and thanks to those of you who have traveled too. Um, in the, the networking this morning, I've already gotten to meet uh, many of you from across the state of Colorado, uh, but I've met others um, from across uh, the mountain region. So folks who traveled in from Wyoming, from New Mexico, uh, from Arizona, um, and elsewhere. So thank you all for being here. Um, and I love the themes that have already emerged um, in terms of listening, connecting, and getting things done. Uh, so my comments will be along those same lines, um, specific to some of the programs we have at the U.S. Department of Energy to help make those happen. Um, I'll focus on the, the title program for today's event, uh, 48C, um, which is a charismatic uh, title bend to our, our colleagues at the IRS and Treasury, um, especially when it comes to the tune of $10 billion. Uh, but also want to allude to some other programs that my office, the Office of Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chains, um, is administering, as well as I want to underscore in the agenda you will have the chance to meet with others of us from the federal government, um, I think in this room over here later today. Um, I saw at least a half dozen tables uh, reflecting at least a half dozen other programs to help listen, connect, and make things happen. So looking forward to a great day. Okay, so in our time together, uh, with me in front of you at least, um, I'll explain uh, what is the connection between DOE and IRS and Treasury, why is the Office of Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chains, which is a mouthful, so MESC, uh, to use that abbreviation that Brian introduced, rolls off the tongue a little more easily. Um, so give you a little background on our office. Um, what relevant programs does MESC administer? So a little bit of a preview in a way uh, of 48C as the main event, um, alluding to some other programs available uh, to you and your stakeholders. Um, then uh, on to 48C, um, some specific details of that program and how it might help um, in this part of the country. Um, again, referring back to uh, the, um, the set aside specifically for energy communities um, of that $10 billion total available, um, 4 billion has been set aside. Um, and we'll talk about how that works. And when I say 4 billion, that's at least 4 billion that has been set aside for energy uh, communities. And then we'll wrap with some uh, time for Q and A from all of you. Okay, so starting with MESC, um, why am I the one up here talking uh, to you about 48C today? Um, so we've heard a lot about transition. Um, transition can mean a lot of things in the context of today's conversation. Um, a lot of the remarks we heard in the opening segment were about transitions that didn't happen smoothly in the past. Um, and I think that sets the stage for underscoring the importance of making sure future energy transitions happen the right way. Um, with the support of the local communities, with support for the local workforce, um, and with support for future, uh, the future for those communities. And so with that in mind, uh, MESC is really the part of the Department of Energy that is relatively new. Our office is only two years old, but we're focused on the how of the energy transition. So recognizing that an energy transition is coming and indeed is very much underway, um, how can MESC operate um, really at the, the knife's edge of the latest and greatest technology, working on deployment projects to help clean energy make its way um, to your communities um, in terms of new manufacturing jobs? preserving manufacturing jobs and expanding um, the clean energy workforce and supply chain. Um, we do that with our mission of focusing on leveraging uh, public investment and private 
um, capital investment. Uh, so using those public private partnerships to grow um, direct engagement by your communities in the clean energy transition. Um, by a $20 billion of direct investment through our office, MESC alone, um, that's partial overlap with what the, um, um, the uh, interagency working group has already done. But that 20 plus 20, that's already $40 billion we're thinking about right there, in addition to leveraging additional resources across the interagency. And the vision, critically important here, again, this transition could happen different ways. We know that it needs to happen differently than transitions that have happened before. So we want to do this in a way that eliminates vulnerabilities in our U.S. clean energy supply chain. Those are vulnerabilities in manufacturing, in sourcing, in the supply chains themselves, but also the people that make that happen. So um, our office, MESC, is investing in facilities, investing in technologies, and investing in people. And we can see uh, that approach to investing here on the next slide. So MESC's investment activities are underpinned by robust analytical modeling. And so you can see that manufacturing analytics backbone um, on the bottom of this slide. Um, and we use that to identify how to be the most impactful um, in terms of the public-private partnerships that support um, this just transition. Um, and what does that analysis tell us? The analysis tells us that investing in these clean energy communities is critical. Um, huge opportunity here, big opportunity to make a difference, not just in terms of shoring up supply chains, shoring up domestic manufacturing, growing uh, those clean energy domestic capabilities, but doing it um, with domestic labor um, and supporting good jobs. Um, and so on top of that analytics backbone, um, we have investments in manufacturing um, and parallel investments in workforce. Um, and that's critical because um, you need the people uh, to actually staff the facilities for all of this to work. And so as we think holistically about our investments in communities, we'll be thinking about the technologies, the manufacturing facilities, where that's happening, and the workforce uh, that's actually doing that work. I want to underscore here at the bottom, um, I'm happy to, to be here today um, uh, on representing MESC, um, but we work very closely uh, with sister offices across the Department of Energy and similar programs. I know Brian was just telling us about uh, exciting annou announcements uh, from our colleagues in the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, OSED. Um, we also work with colleagues in the Grid Deployment Office, um, other parts uh, of the Department of Energy and through the um, uh, interagency working group across the federal government. So very happy to have all those voices uh, together here to connect with you today. Okay, um, this next slide, um, we have a graph. Uh, I'm a little bit of a data nerd, uh, which always feels good to be back on a university campus. Um, this slide, uh, especially good because uh, I get a little of a, a conceptual diagram um, that I hope work, works for all of you, um, as well as for uh, this academic atmosphere. Um, but MESC is, is unique, I think, uh, in terms of the, um, the gap we try to help address um, in growing manufacturing and addressing supply chain gaps. Um, and uh, we build a bridge um, between DOE's long uh, history um, in R&D, uh, clean energy technology development and demonstration, um, and actually walking the bridge from that demonstration um, to bankability um, and public-private um, uh, debt financing through our loan programs office. And so the diagram you see here is highlighting MESC um, in blue, showing how we are a new piece of the DOE ecosystem. Again, our office is only a couple years old, uh, but you can see on your, um, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna go professorial here. I do have a side gig as a professor. I promise to keep my lecture short. Um, but on the Y axis, um, you can see technology readiness level. So this is a standard way we measure at the Department of Energy with our stakeholders, how ready a technology is to make its way to market. So from basic um, at the bottom side of that Y axis to well commercialized or well ready for commercialization, I should say, at the top of that axis. Um, but it's not just about is the technology ready. Uh, we've had lots of exciting technologies that have come out of the department over the years, and some are more successful than others. And that's because there's another dimension to the axes here. And that is along the x-axis or the bottom of your slide here, it's commercialization readiness level. And so that's measuring the, the other intangibles about have we gotten lost town? Um, do we have markets ready? Do we have robust supply chains? Do we have the workforce that's able to produce these technologies such that supply and demand um, can work um, in our American economy? Um, and when you take those together, you want to climb this clean energy technology curve such that you have more mature technology, more ready for commercialization. And so again, MESC fills um, that arc between investment in the R&D of next generation technology 
what our colleagues in the loan programs office are already doing um, with technologies that are commercializable um, to fill that gap, make sure that we're shoring up supply chain vulnerabilities, turning those vulnerabilities into opportunities and doing it by investing in domestic manufacturing and domestic uh, um, uh, workforce capabilities. Okay, um, as a function of the analysis informing our investment in ma manufacturing, informing our investment in the workforce, um, we already have, in just our two years of existence, 71 projects across 38 states. Um, Colorado is reflected there, um, so we actually have a project um, a little bit northwest of town um, focused on uh, actually um, insulating glass for windows, so very efficient production for a very efficient product there. So very happy, in addition to all of the other investment uh, that the IWG has mentioned, that other parts of DOE have made, uh, MESC is happy to be contributing here in Colorado. But I want to point out, as proud as I am of that one dot, there is room for a lot more dots um, in Colorado looking ahead. So um, let's keep that conversation going and figure out, figure out how we make that happen um, for the rest of the day. And if you look across the MESC portfolio, again, MESC is a subset of what the department is doing, the department as a subset of what the interagency is doing. Uh, MESC has already uh, catalyzed over $7 billion of private sector investment. Um, our programs to date are typically about 50-50 cost share, um, not true in all cases, but using that heuristic, that's about $14 billion um, invested across public and private investment through our office alone. Um, we've created 8,000 jobs um, in addition to other programs we've used to retain jobs, helping folks transition um, from um, careers uh, that may be threatened by the clean energy transition into a career that can flourish and contribute as part of that transition. Um, the next statistic particularly relevant and of interest for today's conversation, so 34% of investment in energy justice communities. That is great, but it is shy of 40%. So what does that mean? That means we have to invest more than 40% looking ahead to make sure that on average we hit that 40% target uh, across the MES portfolio. So great news for conversations today and really underscoring making these things happen in the communities that we care about. Um, in addition, we have training um, at industrial assessment centers like the Colorado School of Mines. So over 500 students trained each year and over 10 million electric vehicles in the annual. Um, so MESC, a young office, we're off to a quick start um, and we're working hard and are looking forward to finding out how we can work with you um, the rest of the day. So pivoting slightly uh, from the background about MESC, um, to some of our um, other program before we get to the, the headliner 40C, um, I want to start with the Advanced Energy Manufacturing and Recycling Grant Program, um, another great name, Ben. Um, I will call this 40209 uh, for shorthand, just because it's easier to say uh, than the title there, but the title does give you um, a, a pretty intuitive understanding of what this program intends to do. Um, this program is very timely. There is a QR code on the slide. I will not be offended if you get your phone out and use that QR code right now. Um, we, we know how to multitask in a, a post-COVID world, um, but I want you to do that because this program is open. It is currently accepting concept papers through April 8th. Um, one thing I will say several times on this slide, you have to submit a concept paper in order to submit a full application. I'll say it again to drive it home. You have to submit a concept paper in order to submit an application. So as I talk through this slide, if this sounds relevant to you, use that QR code, think about getting that concept paper in by the April 8th deadline. But this is $425 million uh, in grants available through an open FOA or a funding opportunity announcement. Um, it is designed to benefit small and medium sized manufacturing firms. Um, you can find the definition of small and medium manufacturing firms or SMMs using that QR code. Um, and 100% of this program, not 40%, but 100% of this program um, is designated to projects and communities that have experienced coal mine or coal fired power plant unit closures. Um, so again, not 40%, the entirety of this program is focused on small and medium manufacturers in these communities. And qualifying projects can be one or two types of projects. So first, any support for advanced energy property projects. Energy property projects sounds vague. Um, in some ways it is by design because the scope is broad here. Um, so we have a, some small italic text to underscore uh, what we mean there. Projects to establish, re-equip, or expand facilities to produce or recycle clean energy products. Um, what do we mean by clean energy products? Think of a clean energy system. Now think of the entire supply chain that gets you to that final clean energy system. 
any of those pieces along the way, any of the manufacturing, any of the, the, um, the labor uh, to contribute to that final system counts uh, as an energy property product. Um, and so uh, if you are a small and medium manufacturer, if you know a small and medium manufacturer that's contributing um, to this manufacturing, this workforce, make sure they know about this program, please. And there is another category, greenhouse gas emission reduction projects for industrial processes. Um, so here, similar language projects to establish, re-equip, or expand industrial and manufacturing facilities with equipment designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through, and we have illustrative methods of greenhouse gas emissions here, but there's going to be a catch-all at the end. So for example, um, energy efficiency and industrial waste reduction technologies, uh, lower zero carbon heat systems, carbon capture, transport, reuse, um, storage, uh, low embodied carbon materials, and again, um, other industrial technologies that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So a broad um, topic here. So um, a project does not have to satisfy both. It can satisfy one or the other or both. Um, that's fantastic too. Um, but again, this is specific to small and medium manufacturers in um, communities that have experienced coal mine or coal fired power plant unit closures. Um, I wanna direct your attention to the map on the right hand side and I've seen um, well done by the team that has planned this and thanks to them. Um, uh, this was rolling in the background before we got started. So hopefully this has already caught your eye. But a whole bunch of those areas highlighted are in the areas from which I know many of you have traveled based on our conversations this morning. So a whole host of them here in Colorado, uh, but others in Wyoming, um, New Mexico, Arizona, uh, over into um, uh, Utah. Um, so a, a great opportunity and a very timely one for folks who are considering applying here. Okay, another program, the Extended Product System Rebate Program. Um, this is a rebate program, but what do we mean by Extended Product System? So EPS, um, we needed a legal catch-all phrase to describe all systems that were this first bullet point here, um, variable speed motors and their control systems. And so what does that mean? This is basically any pump, um, any compressor, any fan um, that you can use a smart control with. So operated efficiently as a function of um, that control system. So $10 million is available for this particular provision. Um, most of this is still left, um, and this is a, 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 it's a formula. And so rather than applying as part of a competitive funding opportunity, um, all you do is contact us through an application portal. We have a QR code there again, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. I won't be offended. Um, if you multitask, please take advantage of this. Um, if you can think of extended product systems for which rebates should apply, um, but the rebate is a formula of, as a function of the size of the motor um, and the, uh, the control system multiplied by $25. So the bigger the pump, uh, the bigger the fan, the bigger the compressor, the larger the rebate. Um, entities can receive up to $25,000 per year. So you can receive rebates for multiple fans, uh, pumps, compressors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there is a time constraint here. Um, and so this is um, retrospective uh, based on the way the statute was written. Um, so any extended product system, again, fan, pump, motor, motor et cetera, um, that was purchased and installed between October 1st, 2021 and September 30th, 2023 um, is eligible, as well as any extended product system part of a bigger system. Um, so uh, if, if there was a larger upgrade that involved an upgrade to that EPS between January 1st, 2021 and December 31st, 2022. So take advantage of that QR code um, and get those, uh, get those rebates. All right, um, so all of that, uh, the MESS background, the related programs has been built up to uh, the uh, 48C program. Um, and I'll spend uh, most of the rest of my time with you talking about that program in particular. What is it and how can you apply? Um, so one more background slide um, talking about um, collaboration between um, MESC, again, the Office of Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chains, who I represent, and the Energy Communities IWG, who is kind enough to organize this event and other related events. Um, so MESC, we do have the $20 billion of investment that I described over the past few slides, um, focused on supply chain vulnerabilities, turning those vulnerabilities into opportunities by focusing on investment in manufacturing um, and in the workforce to support that manufacturing, as well as the analytical tools to be efficient with those investments. Um, working closely with our colleagues across the interagency and through the IWG um, to target breaking down barriers in these energy communities. I wanna to return to that theme of we're here to listen, um, we're here to connect, and we're here to make things happen. 
So these slides are designed to help us understand um, how to make those connections specific to 48C um, and how to make things happen um, with that 48C tax credit. Um, I really, really like um, the bullets at the end of the IWG overview here. So I just wanna um, articulate those aloud, but creating good paying jobs, remediating environmental damage, supporting energy workers and spurring economic revitalization. Um, so certainly a lot of the goal and hopefully part of the reason all of you came here today those themes are worth keeping in mind as we talk about 48C. That language will not reappear, but keep that in mind at the back of your head. To the extent 48C can help you achieve those things, we want to help you do that. Okay, um, this is where, um, as Brian mentioned earlier, um, MESC is helping administer um, this program on behalf of U.S. Treasury and our IRS colleagues. Um, it would not be an IRS presentation if I didn't have a slide from our attorneys. So here's that slide. Um, and this is important um, because this is a competitive program. Um, all of the information I'll give you today will be based on publicly released information. We do want to help connect you to this program, but we can't give anyone an unfair advantage in applying to this program. So want to underscore that again, all the information uh, that we'll discuss today, all of the information we can share in the office hours later today is public information. And please, please, please use the resources that we'll share with you. Um, I understand we have a whole um, cheat sheet of QR codes to get you to the right places on the IRS website, um, but official um, news um, and uh, requirements about the Ford AC program are released on the IRS website via uh, official notices from the IRS. So all applicants, all potential applicants are strongly encouraged to carefully read those notices on the IRS's website. And again, we'll have links to those. Um, merit, review, merit review criteria, which I'll discuss for round one here in a few slides. So um, how the department thought about evaluating applications as part of this, um, uh, uh, the, the first part um, of this particular program. Um, uh, uh, the, um, those are officially published in a notice on the IRS website. Um, and this, this third bullet really drives it home. The notice is the controlling document. So we'll try to help make the right kinds of connections today to listen from you, how we can get the right public information to you. But again, the uh, ultimate authority here um, is to uh, visit the IRS website and review those notices. So with all that in mind, here we go. What is 48C? So 48C um, is an investment tax credit that was expanded by the Inflation Reduction Act, or IRA, rolls off the tongue, with $10 billion for three categories. The first of those is clean energy manufacturing and recycling. You can see that highlighted in yellow on the upper right-hand side of this slide. And we, we show that in yellow because, as Brian Anderson mentioned earlier, this program was actually first established by the um, ARA program back in 2009, sub subsequently expanded to also include recycling. Um, and here, this category means to re-equip, expand, or establish industrial or manufacturing facility production or recycling of clean energy and energy efficiency, uh, efficiency technologies. So that's one of three areas that are now in scope for the 48C program. So the second one, which is new for the latest iteration of the 48C program, so not included in the 2009 version, but again, the Inflation Reduction Act expanded the program. So critical uh, materials processing, refining, and recycling, you can see additional detail on the right-hand side there. So again, re-equipping, expanding, or establishing an industrial facility to process, refine, or recycle critical materials to include 50 minerals listed by the USGS, um, as well as uh, a short list on DOE's website of critical materials. And a third category, um, industrial greenhouse gas emission reductions. So again, um, investing in re-equipping industrial or manufacturing facilities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 20%. So that 20% reduction would qualify you for the third category here. So um, projects that are selected for a tax credit allocation receive a 30% investment tax credit or 6% if the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements are not met. And at least 40%, so 40% or above of the total $10 billion will be allocated to projects in energy communities. Okay, um, a bit more on eligible entities and then I wanna dive into what uh, energy communities means in the specific context of 48C. Um, so here, eligible entities, um, it is a broad list that are consistent with the three categories we saw on the preceding slide. So clean energy manufacturers for that first category, clean energy manufacturing, critical materials processors, refiners, and recyclers, 
consistent with that second category, doing the processing, refining, recycling of those critical minerals and materials um, in industrial facilities, planning greenhouse gas emissions reduction projects consistent with topic three from the preceding slide. So why does this matter? 48C stands to play a critical role um, in creating high quality jobs, reducing industrial emissions and increasing domestic production of critical clean energy products and materials. Um, and to target this, I think even closer to home for today's conversation, what do we mean when we say um, energy communities for the 48C program? So you can see a very similar map here to what we saw a few slides ago, specific to the 40209 program. Um, this map differs only slightly, um, and I'll explain the nuanced here in a moment, um, but want to underscore, I think the, the blue box here in the center of the slide really underscores um, the motivation for today's conversation and the potential for what we can do together uh, with the connections that we hope to make. So energy communities have the knowledge, infrastructure, resources, and know-how to play a leading role in the move to a clean energy economy. So leveraging this 48C credit, leveraging the resources in these communities, working together to make these things happen um, really would be a best case benefit um, uh, and outcome um, as a function of today's conversation. So again, of the 10 billion, at least 4 billion is set aside to go to those communities. Um, and we have specific definitions for energy communities in this context. So census tracts with coal mines that have closed since December 31st, 1999, census tracts with coal power plants that have closed since December 31st, 2009, census tracts immediately adjacent to either of the above. And that definition is identical to 40209 so far. Um, the piece that's different here is that census tracts that do have a pre-IRA, so from the 2009 program, if a census tract received funding, um, it does not count as an energy community in the Inflation Reduction Act version. That does not mean it's not eligible. Um, it just wouldn't count in the calculus for the $4 billion of the $10 billion. So everyone's still eligible, but for the $4 billion um, set aside for energy communities, we'd want to satisfy um, those, um, those requirements. Um, and want to highlight again, I know I highlighted this when we talked about the 40209 slide, um, but we've zoomed in on the four corners here in the upper right hand of this slide. You see a whole bunch of blue there indicating a whole bunch of eligible geography for this particular program. So very happy to, to have all of you here today, but in particular those of you from these communities or with connections to these communities, um, let's make sure we find out how to make this program work for you. Okay, so what does the application process look like? So the 48C program may follow a two-stage application process, followed by certification and placed in service requirements for successful applic applicants. What does that mean? Um, so this flowchart helps make that intuitive in four steps. So we start with a concept paper. I said this for 40209, I'll say it again here for 48C. You have to submit a concept paper in order to submit a full application. So what does a concept paper mean uh, in the context of the 48C program? So basically interested applicants submit a concept paper detailing the proposed project. Concept paper is intuitive here. It's a brief description of what's going to be proposed. Um, those concept papers are then reviewed by the department um, and then a decision is made um, after which applicants receive either an encourage or a discourage letter from DOE. Um, now the next step is application. And um, I want to point out um, whether you receive an encouraged letter or a discouraged letter or not, you are allowed to move on to the application stage. So the application stage is where you prepare your full proposal. Um, and we highlight there whether encouraged or discouraged, interested applicants submit an application, full application, 35 pages. So you want to feel strong about your application to take the time to prepare it. Those application papers are reviewed by the Department of Energy. Um, and then applicants at this stage will receive an allocation letter or a denial letter uh, from the IRS. The allocation letter is a signal that a tax credit has been allocated for your project. Denial letter is the opposite. Um, and then certification has to happen for that tax credit to actually manifest. Um, and that is that projects have to meet certification requirements within two years of allocation. If those requirements are met, the IRS will certify the 48C facility by sending a certification letter. And then finally, placed in service, step four and the last of this uh, flowchart, projects must be placed in service within two years of certification. Applicants receive the tax credit the year the project is placed in service. So we go concept paper, we go application. You have to start with concept paper, keep in mind. Application, on to certification, and then placed in service within two years for the tax credit to be received. 
All right. So the concept paper and the application are clearly critical to this process because getting through the concept paper and the application stage um, is what gets you to that allocation letter that allows you to move on to certification and placed in service. So I'll spend time on the next few slides talking specifically about technical review criteria. Um, so these technical review criteria were published as specific to round one um, of the 40 AC program. Um, so round one, the IRS has announced will close um, at the end of this month. Um, round two, the IRS has announced um, should be amount, uh, announced in the coming months. Um, and so if you talk to us in office hours, please don't try to, uh, to nail the date down more than that. We'll have to stick with that language in the coming months, um, but hopefully um, underscores enough that uh, time to, to think about preparing. Um, so uh, since only the guidance for round one is public at this point, um, that's where we'll focus on the next few slides. And so in that round one technical review, um, we had four evaluation criteria, which you see reflected on this slide. Um, I'll dive into each in slightly more detail um, on the slides that follow. Um, so criteria one, commercial viability. Criteria two, greenhouse gas emissions impacts. Criteria three, strengthening US supply chains and domestic manufacturing for a net zero economy. And finally, criteria four, workforce and community engagement. Um, so the Department of Energy evaluates concept papers and full applications both as a function of these four criteria, um, as well as any additional overarching uh, program policy factors identified by notice 2023-44. I mentioned at the beginning of this section, those IRS notices really are king in this process. Um, so um, the summary here is public, um, available in other media, and probably the easiest to digest. But again, um, the, um, uh, the ultimate authority here um, are those notices on the IRS website. All right, um, and then just a reminder here on the lower right-hand side, so the, um, of the 10 billion total, 4 billion uh, at least is set aside for energy communities. Round one, um, the um, announced target was $4 billion total for the program. So 1.6 of that, uh, 1.6 billion, I should say, of that was set aside for energy communities, um, which means um, round two would look to spend um, the remainder um, of that $10 billion. Okay, so looking first at criterion one, commercial viability. Um, so what do we mean by commercial viability? Um, it's considering things and demonstrating things um, in your concept paper and full application, like um, ability to control your project schedule and time from certification to completion. Um, so showing considerations like the firmness of site selection and progress towards securing required permits um, and the reasonableness of your estimated timeframes. Um, also the extent to which risk management issues and mitigation strategies are identified and addressed, um, as well as the strength of the proposed business plan. Um, and there's various aspects that are considered there, including the potential for commercial deployment, the source and certainty of funding, the strength of key arrangements, the proposed project's economic viability, sustainability, and potential growth, the degree to which the investment is profitable, and the levelized cost of generated or stored energy compared to similar technologies or materials within the same market segment. And lastly, um, a bullet that's also important here at the bottom, uh, the management team's track record of success and corporate health. So all of these taken together are considerations um, that bubble up to that first criterion, commercial viability. Our second criterion, greenhouse gas emissions impacts. Um, this one, somewhat more intuitive. We want to reduce those greenhouse gas emissions impacts, obviously, um, but specifically the language that you'll see um, in the notice that's summarized here um, talks specifically about in products impact on avoidance or reduction in anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gas emissions based on considerations of um, potential greenhouse gas improvement over, um, over higher emitting incumbent technologies, um, the potential to capture or remove carbon oxides or other greenhouse gas emissions, the potential to provide indirect emissions reductions by enabling reductions elsewhere, um, and the potential of recycling projects to avoid or reduce emissions associated with raw materials or other aspects of the supply chain. Um, additional consideration, the extent to which the efficiency, lifetime, recyclability, or other characteristics that reduce overall greenhouse gas emissions of the facility's products exceed those of incumbents or competitors, and finally, efforts to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions from the proposed manufacturing or recycling facility. 
So these bullets are important because the overall idea of greenhouse gas emissions reduction matters here, but there are various aspects of greenhouse gas emissions reductions to consider um, in your concept paper and your um, uh, full proposal narratives. Moving on to criteria three, so strengthening U.S. supply chains and domestic manufacturing for a net zero economy. Um, this is another title that has some keywords in it. Um, supply chains, domestic manufacturing, net zero economy. And the bullets here help us make sense uh, in this summary of the language in the IRS notice. So the extent to which the proposed project addresses current and anticipated supply chain vulnerabilities for clean energy product, uh, products, the extent to which the product would increase domestic production capacity and availability of clean energy products that facilitate progress toward a net zero energy economy, the extent to which the proposed project addresses current and anticipated supply chain vulnerabilities for clean energy products that facilitate progress towards a net zero economy. And in the case of recycling projects, um, these technical review criteria will be evaluated based on which materials are produced at the recycling facility and evidence that those materials will serve as inputs back into clean energy supply chains. And then moving on to our fourth criterion, workforce and community engagement, obviously a very uh, topical um, subject for uh, today's conversation with energy communities. Um, several aspects of this summarized here on the slide uh, based on language in the IRS notice, including job creation and workforce community, very much aligned with other themes that have already been highlighted in comments earlier today and subsequent discussions. Um, I know many of us are looking forward to have for the rest of uh, the day. Um, ensuring timely project completion through workforce and community engagement. Um, engagement, a key word there. Um, energy community transition. Um, transition is very much a theme of the day, uh, so another timely issue for discussion. And local environmental impacts. Um, all of those boiling up um, to the overarching fourth and last criterion for evaluation for concept papers and for proposals, uh, workforce and community engagement. So one more slide on energy community transition, uh, the last bullet from that last slide. Um, and so we've talked a bit about this already, but the statutory language in terms of how we define energy community um, is shown here. Um, so energy communities are census tracts that have ever had since December 31st, 1999, a closed coal mine or have ever had since December 31st, 2009, a retired coal fired electric generating unit and directly adjoining tracts, except for census tracts with applicants that previously received 48C credit allocations prior to the date of the enactment of IRA. That's consistent with the bullets you saw a few slides ago uh, that were juxtaposed with the map. Um, but wanted you to see the official language here. This is the language that dictates what's considered an energy community in the context of 48C. So um, within this context, applicants may describe plans to repurpose existing infrastructure and assets that have been abandoned due to the closing of a coal mine or coal plant or describe plans to maintain high quality jobs for both new and incumbent workers, such as honoring existing collective bargaining agreements at facilities that are being retooled and identifying and working with local unions to employ workers dislocated from fossil energy or manufacturing employment. So um, one couple slides left um, and then we'll move on to Q&A, um, but wanted to highlight as a function of the IRS notice that described the first round of 48C um, there was a list of priority areas that was released. And so you can see that reflected here. Um, again, round one is scheduled to complete by the end of this month. Um, and the IRS has publicly stated that they intend to release the guidance for round two in the coming months. Uh, but for round one, the clean energy manufacturing and recycling priority areas were um, electric, uh, electric grid um, to include the manufacturing of grid components like transformers, um, electrical steel, amorphous alloys, power electronics, and other grid components and equipment. Um, electric heat pumps, um, including manufacturing um, of the air and ground source heat pumps components and infrastructure, um, including priority areas for reversing valves, control circuits, compressors, and heat exchangers. Electric vehicles, including onboard power electronics, um, several listed parenthetically there from semiconductors, modules, and circuits for traction drives to onboard chargers, converters, and EV charging stations. Um, as well as permanent magnets and battery components. Um, nuclear energy, so manufacturing of specialized components and equipment for nuclear power reactors or their fuels, including the fabrication of fuels and manufacturing of equipment for conversion, enrichment, and deconversion um, for existing and new reactor deployments. Solar energy across the supply chain, polysilicon wafer production, ingot and wafer production, and solar glass production facilities. Sustainable aviation fuels or SAF, 
uh, manufacturing of equipment needed for low carbon aviation fuel production, emphasis on the equipment there, um, and wind energy, component production facilities and specialized steel production, particularly for offshore wind, including monopile grade steel and towers, recycling of wheel uh, components, particularly blades. And um, on a penultimate slide, a call for reviewers. Um, so very much looking forward to working with you, uh, you all again today to listen, to connect, to make things happen in the context of all of the programs reflected here today, um, particularly 48C and on behalf of, of my office, the Office of Manufacturing Energy Supply Chains, um, but want to underscore in addition to helping get these dollars to energy communities, um, we are looking for folks to help us do that efficiently. Um, so you saw my description of the concept paper and the full proposal review process. We do leverage expertise within the department and across the interagency, but we also leverage experts um, from private industry and other proximal stakeholders. So if you're planning to apply, please don't volunteer to be a reviewer. That would create an awkward conflict of interest for all of us. But if you are in a position to help us make this process go efficiently, smoothly, and effectively, and are not uh, directly tied to someone who plans to propose, please contact me. We want to work with you. Um, if you have expertise, particularly in many of those areas on the preceding slide, you can help us provide input uh, by reacting to the applications we receive, to the concept papers we receive, to make sure that the cream rises uh, to the top, um, such that the, the highest potential, uh, most rewarding, highest impact uh, projects in energy communities and beyond um, are those that make it through this process. And thank you in advance um, to any willing volunteers. Um, so with that, for more information about 48C, um, we will be around for office hours today, but want to direct you to um, the email address here. We'll have a QR code for this email address later today, but 48C questions at hc.doe.gov. Um, anything that is not available in public information that you want specifically answered has to go here. Um, again, I'll return to my theme earlier. Very much want to listen, connect, and make things happen with energy communities in this region. Uh, but our public conversation has to be limited to publicly available information. Um, if you think your question can't be answered with that public information, this is the email address to go. We can answer your question in a public forum such that everyone has access to that information. So we can still answer it. We just have to make sure we do it such that everyone has access to the answer. So a great um, uh, um, resource there, as well as the landing page for the 48C uh, site itself. Um, versions of these slides, um, as well as a version of this talk, are also available on the website there, energy.gov slash infrastructure slash 48C. So please check that out to refresh your memory as you think about applying or working with um, folks in your energy communities um, who would benefit from applying. So I think with that, we walked through MESC, um, we walked through uh, non 48 c MESC programs, uh, spent quite a bit of time on 48 c and I think I'm pretty close um, to my timing actually. So um, looking forward to Q&A with all of you and discussion for the rest of the day. Thank you all, uh, thank you to Minds for having us and really, really, really looking forward to the good work we can do together. Thank you. Got one more stool. I think with that, I'm going to welcome Zach Valdez and Brian Anderson to the stage and back to the stage for our QA session. So please welcome Zach and Brian. So I think we actually have mics or a mic um, in the middle of the room. So if folks want to line up there or raise your hands, that can rove. Thank you, Katie, for helping make that happen. Um, but happy, I think, for all of us here team, answers uh, from questions uh, about any of the segments, the introductory remarks, 4AC, or other programs. Hi, uh, George Little from uh, Light in San Jose. Um, I led my company's um, a concept paper application for the first 48C round, and we were discouraged. Um, if there's any way for you guys to give any sort of feedback on why we were discouraged, that would be very helpful, because right now I have to answer to my CEO whether we should apply for the next round. We thought we had a very strong application. We have, frankly, no idea why we were discouraged. So if there's any way to get feedback, in that process, that would be extremely helpful. 
Absolutely. I love when the first question is a hard one. Um, so uh, legally, um, we have to stick to public information. Um, so I'd encourage you, if you have specific concerns, reach out to the 48C questions mailbox. Um, and I will I will point out that even though round one is coming to a close, uh, round two we know is forthcoming in the coming weeks, we focused on the recommendations in this talk for round one. Um, I will leave it at that. I, I won't get more specific, but I will allow you to read between these lines. And any additional comments? Does, uh, does, uh, does discourage me they can't apply? It's not. So just for awareness, just because we discourage it means it, it may not align with some of those priorities that we listed. It doesn't mean you can't apply. It just means, uh, you know, given, given how we're looking at the criteria for rating this, it may not uh, coordinate with what we're, we're looking to apply. Yeah, and then the last thing I would say on that is, as, as Jake walked through the mirror review criteria, the four big buckets, commercial viability uh, being one, the heaviest weighted, uh, the community benefits plan being worth 20% in the application, the supply chain, and, and what was the greenhouse gas, and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, if you really look at, we, we send a clear message um, from the department and that guidance around those merit review criteria of what is truly important. And, and we also acknowledge that within a concept paper, you have limited capability of expressing, you know, if it's a complicated project or something, you know, a technology to, to move that is commercially viable, but yet might not be in the market, um, there's, not, there's not that much space in the, in the concept paper. And so then when we, uh, when you, it, it's a non-binding discouragement, you then do have that opportunity to explain more. Um, and, and we did receive a few uh, proposals that, and we can say this, we did receive a few proposals that were discouraged in the first, in the concept paper stage that came in in full, in, in full uh, later. And so that is also an option. But merit review criteria for every applicant really is that it's the roadmap. Yeah, and I think it's public knowledge about the oversubscription. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So did you mention that, Jay? I did not. So I think we published uh, we published the number. Um, I think we had over $3 billion dollars of applicants for the four billion dollars. Um, X. Yeah. Oh, ten X. It was forty billion dollars total. And so at the concept paper stage. At the concept paper stage. Yeah. So it stands to reason, just objectively, there are probably good projects that, as a function of that volume, um, didn't make it. Um, I, I love that we're finding Google to answer your question. Um, the other thing I want to point out, so round one is coming to a close, but round two hasn't been announced yet. So before round two is announced, um, we are less constrained because the competition hasn't started yet um, about open discussion. Again, can't give anyone unfair advantage, but um, there is um, slightly less constraint in terms of the conversation we can have. So very timely for today's discussion prior to the release of the information about round two. Um, but please get those messages to your stakeholders uh, in your energy communities too. Once round two comes out, all questions have to go to that 40 days. Mailbox. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? I think I saw a hand in the front, Katie. A couple of hands in the front. Thank you. In the uh, category of greenhouse gas reduction projects, when you think about the manufacturing and industrial facility, a definition of that, um, given color that we're talking about a university, so a, you know, a non-taxpayer, but that would still be eligible, but they're not a manufacturer, so not producing the product. Um, so specifically like uh, a combined heat and power or a steam plant type industrial facility as part of a campus, is that eligible? So we actually, we're explicitly forbidden from giving eligibility determinations. Um, even if you email that inbox, they won't tell you. What I can point out is we have given a set of criteria that if you can demonstrate you comply with those criteria, you should score well in the concept paper and the full application stage. So I'll say the same thing as before. I'm not sure you between those lines the right way, but we can't give a dirty thing. But you're also not saying that, no, that type of project is not what we have in the middle, so. I'm I'm confident saying we will not say yes or no. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I've got two questions. When the concept paper application period opens, how long will that be open for? The other question that I have 
is if industries are applying for that concept paper, are they going to be eligible even if they have DOE funds or grant funds? So can you use DOE grant funded projects to also qualify for 48C tax credits? Yeah, so uh, in terms of the window uh, of the application, I can't remember the exact exact window, but we can't really speak to it until uh, until we release that guidance. But there was a lot of feedback in, in round one regarding the amount of time available for producing the, uh, the full proposal and the concept paper. And we took a lot of that into account, and as well as it being a second round, um, you know, some efficiencies that we can gain in the review cycle. So we're really trying to squeeze, uh, and squeeze that to get more time for the applicant um, so that you can have better applications. To the second one, in terms of the, the uh, ability to, if an individual applicant already has Department of Energy funding, that's, there's a, a, lot, a lot of different colors in Department of Energy funding. So if it happens to be an LPO grant or an LPO loan guarantee, Loan guaranteed money is, uh, you know, it's all all debt, um, and and is only awarded if um, the applicant demonstrates a reasonable uh, within reason that they will repay, and that uh, the loan is really treated like a loan, like a bank, and they're repaid. So in the end, it's the applicant's money that then gets repaid to the government. In that instance, yes, applicants can. Have a DOE loan covering some of the debt uh, on projects, and then also get a tax credit. Um, on the instance of a grant, um, there are very specific challenges with using the same project with grant dollars to also get a tax credit when it comes to the applicant's qualified investment um, and its applicability if. The federal government is giving funds for that project itself and their income stream and the ta potential taxable income of that for a for-profit entity in particular. So there are some significant challenges to make sure that um, it really is not double dipping. Likewise, the tax credit itself cannot be used as a um, uh, posture for those grants. So most of the grants that are coming out of mass can and the office of the infrastructure are usually about 50 third percent cost share. So to meet the applicant share, uh, you cannot use the tax credit for that either. So then you really have to work on what and, and just to dig down, usually we try to provide at least 30 days for a concept paper. And let's uh Jake had mentioned that the advanced manufacturing and recycling grant bill 40209 somewhat overlines with 48C in terms of that same product that's coming out. So if you were to apply to Bill 40209, let's say it's a $100 million project, cost share would be 50%. So you're gonna put up 50%, we'll put up 50%, we we'll both put in 50 million. You would be able to apply that tax credit on the 50 million you, your company, your organization invest. So 30% of that 50 million, you could get potentially 15 million back. Overall, your, your full investment would be 35. And, and I'm not a tax expert, but there are all kinds of direct pay transferability options within that as well. Thanks. Um, so my question is a little bit more on the process side. You were looking at the slide of like what energy communities were defined and you said, there's a lot of eligible geographies and that's true, almost the whole state of Colorado. Um, but at the same time, we know that's not actually true on the ground of who needs this money and who needs to benefit. Um, I know that like Boulder County has received energy community money and if you're from Colorado, that is laughable. Um, so how do we make sure that the energy communities that really need this money, the really small communities, the Craigs, et cetera, how do we make sure that their people are applying for money and are being connected to developers that want to help instead of the people that have grant writers and staff that have been tracking this and know what they're doing. How do we connect them to this new money and make sure that we're actually trying to like deliver on the outcomes these programs are designed for? Well, I'll, I'll take that one because the, the definition of energy communities, as you see, we have, we can use a term called 48C energy communities. 
because the statute has passed by con Congress, um, specifically designed, specifically designate energy communities, and it's on a binary basis. Either are or you're not in the census tract uh, in question. And so that we, we certainly cannot change uh, the law. Um, but the way that we wanna make sure that the funding and the projects are flowing to disadvantaged energy communities, maybe I'll say it that way, um, where if you dig a little deeper into the economic status, the economic future, the need for revitalization, certainly, you know, Craig and Moffat County, you know, in Colorado are on top of the list, but there's a lot of them. Uh, and the planned closures in the state of Colorado too, is what we're doing here and is the work of you know, the IWG. That's why I wanted to take this one because we know that the places that have grant writers, places that have tax lawyers on staff, potentially, um, have a leg up in a competitive process. And so within, you know, we have the floor by statute and, and tax guidance uh, gives us the, uh, you know, the guardrails by which we have to operate in the context of 48C. But we wanna make sure that there are resources to help the community bring in, bring in those investments through the IWG, through this type of event here. But then on the other side, one of the merit review criteria we have is the community benefits plan. And we know that when, if, if you were to compare two, two projects, that one that has a, that they're both commercially viable, they both fit in the right supply chain, they both have the right greenhouse gas reductions. When it comes to the community benefits plan, a project that's landing in a community that needs the investment and they have a very strong community benefits plan that talks about their their work in the community to revitalize the economy and work with displaced workers things like that their score gets higher and they get the advantage so again you know i said that go back to the merit review criteria that is the map of the guide and when it comes to community benefits plans that's where applications that come over have a competitive advantage if it's truly going to benefit the community in a meaningful way and then before the application, you know, please, you know, we're, you know, we are trying to work with Craig and Monmouth County um, and, uh, and and the other disadvantaged energy communities to make sure that you're you have your competitive advantages as well. That, that would be my answer. I'll add a lighthearted answer from another direction. Um, it has been eye opening um, working with the IRS for the past many months to execute on this program. Um, it is March, April 15th is around the corner. I will not make a tax joke, um, but you can anticipate the level of diligence um, that we have had to do uh, to demonstrate that our processes are the right processes for the IRS um, involves a lot of detail. Um, so keep in mind as part of that process flow diagram, there's a concept paper, there's a full application, there's certification, and there's book and service. The IRS will make darn sure that you were spending the dollars where you said you were going to spend the dollars when you proposed to this program, or you will not get that money. So I don't think there are bad actors in this room. I don't think there are bad actors in your communities, um, at least not that are gonna help us with this transition, but these dollars are gonna be selected to go to these communities because those communities need them. And the IRS is gonna make sure that happens. Oh, you got one. Oh, there's one. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Mike Gibbon will pass it up. Um, first of all, thank you very much. We love seeing you in Colorado. We love seeing you on the western slope because it sounds like you could use a few places to visit. I'll fill in for you. Sasha Nelson with Economic Recovery Corps embedded in northwest Colorado, counties of Route, Moffat, and Rio Blanco. Um, and we were noodling on maps and some of the criteria to uh, the earlier question. Uh, we noticed that there are some difficulties with the census tracts and hoping that maybe you could put us in contact with U.S. Census and perhaps we could change some of the census tracts to um, untangle some of the obstacles in terms of eligibility. For example, in Craig, we're outside of the map. That's where the businesses are hubbed. Um, for the most part, the mines and the, the mining lands and the closures are, of course, in the, the county area. So there's a disconnect between where the businesses are and where the eligibility is right now. And I think we could fix that, um, you know, and, and maybe arguably some of those businesses could change their geography slightly. But 
Um, it might also be time to reconsider census maps and, and how those track with uh, development potential and possibility. We do have assets in Northwest Colorado, so I'm gonna put a shameless plug in if you are a developer in the room and looking for an asset. Matthew Mendesco from the town of Hayden is here. Uh, I am here. We've got our full transition folks in the room uh, and our economic development professionals to sell you on our assets, our places. Um, finally, I have a, a question for you. Besides, can you connect me to U.S. Census so we can fix the track issue? I'm wondering, in first round, sometimes I think it's problematic for our small communities to think on such large scale. When in reality, we may only need a small slice. So I'm curious, in the first round, what was the smallest uh, grant project and proposal that you saw come through, and what would be were the bigger ones weighted more favorably, or or did you try to have a, a range of project sizes? So based on the concept papers, it was a range of of millions of dollars, if not billions. And the thing that I, I can't give guidance on, but I can say. Um, Concept papers are just that, they're concept papers. And a lot of times you don't have the, the exact value that you're looking for. And it's okay to put a value down that doesn't necessarily align just to get it on there. You may not get encouraged with that, but all that's meaning is you, you put something down that doesn't make financial sense when we look at it, but you know back in your side, like, hey, we're just, we're putting this concept paper in because we're working the numbers just so it's it's like a placeholder, right? And so those those ranges are very large. And you can imagine that companies that have more well-developed capabilities can be more direct on, on the number they have, whereas smaller communities may not. And so don't take that discouragement as a, um, no, you're not allowed to apply. It just means based on what you told us in that initial amount, that probably doesn't align where, where we see commercial viability. And I would, I would add to that, we really are wanting to support small and medium enterprises. And so, uh, no, you know, what is it? No, no job, I already mentioned I have a seven year old, so no, no job is too big, no bucket too small. No project is too small if it's going to make an impact in those four criteria. It's going to have an impact on the business, the community impacts, it's fitting in the supply chain, it's commercially viable, all projects are on the table. And so there, there is a huge range. What's that? Yeah, fully agree. Fully agree. Great question. And I want to point to my 40219 colleagues over here if you want to raise their hand, because remember, 40219, it's a similar program to 40AC focused specifically on small and medium manufacturers, and it's a 50-50. Uh, grant as opposed to a 30% tax credit. So please find them in office hours later um, and let's make sure that connection happens. And there's no reason not to apply for both or even to use the near term need to put in a concept paper for 429 to prepare for an eventual release of round two guidance for 40 AC. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a question from the perspective of an OEM. So we're here mostly for uh, 40209, but um, for the 48C, you know, it's our customers that would be getting the benefit that we make the industrial equipment, but they're the owners and operators. So could you maybe just speak to, you know, how that would look if we're kind of driving them to apply, but it does need to be them to apply, if I'm understanding that correctly? Yeah. So can't offer specific advice on the situation, but I'll observe um, the, the application platform allows for um, letters of support or partnerships. Um, so I think there's a way for you to think about that, um, to be part of applications. Um, I am not the expert on that role, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there to see if Brian has anything to add, but um, that might be something if we get a, uh, a card that may exist already in the FAQ on the 40 C question site. Yeah, and I, I may have been misunderstanding the question, but you know, on the 40 C uh, piece, say, say for example, I'll just give a generic example. Um, we are in 40 C investing in every component of let's pick your supply chain, let's say solar. Let's pick solar. 
So in the solar supply chain, you're manufacturing you know, everything from ingots to wafers to uh, you know, polysilicon, all that stuff. It, it goes into even the circuitry, you know, manufacturing components that then get assembled into a, into a final solar panel and then sold as, you know, by, by an installer. The person who is buying the solar panels and then installing is not a well, I guess I should say that, but in general, it is about the manufacturing of the equipment itself. And so, I mean, you know, in terms of. Yeah, I guess just as a clarification, like let, let's say our customer is a large industrial manufacturer and we're just, this isn't us. Sure. So they, they're, there's an industrial customer and they're going to, you know, install heat pumps throughout mm -hmm. their. And we're going to manufacture the heat pumps. Oh yeah. The actual project to install the heat pumps is going to qualify. That would qualify for the investment tax credit, clean energy investment tax credit, um, or if it's a, a different sort of uh, uh, scenario, it could be the uh, production tax credit on producing electrons. Say you're you're installing wind turbine, and you do you choose the PTC side, the 48C program. Is for upgrading or create expanding or creating a new manufacturing supply line. I mean, it could be a, an expansion of the supply, uh, an expansion of the manufacturing line or a new facility to build the heat itself. That's the 48C. And I think heat pumps, if that is your example, was even in that priority list earlier. So, yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, I happen to be, um, I, I'm with, I'm with Deloitte, I'm with the professional services group. We assisted a number of clients with their 48C applications. And um, one of the things that we saw just nationally across our client base is there's a hunger for perspective. And so you mentioned earlier that, you know, it was oversubscribed for, you know, I think the numbers that I've heard publicly stated somewhere, I don't know where it was, 42 billion. Right, the concept papers, 11 billion of which was in um, energy communities. Spot on. All right, so so telephone game didn't, didn't break it down, but um, I know for the application phase that our clients will want that same sort of perspective. And so my question is, you don't have to tell me any specifics about any of this, but I guess you know I'll just lay out a handful of things. So. Are you going to announce um, who the winners were for round one? I know back in 2009 and 13, the list was published, and you know there was a little blurb of, of what types of projects. Because that helps companies decide, hey, should I apply in round two? Oh, you know, there's a similar project. So that helps, right? I hear someone clapping, right? So I, that helps them with, you know, this is something, you know, this gentleman here just talked about heat pumps. What if he went and looked at the list and said, oh, Maybe we should chase that down for us, right? So I think that would be really helpful. Um, I also think the stats on the application phase. So, you know, if I have a client that doesn't get an award, they know that 42 billion was in the concept paper pick phase, but people are gonna wanna, wanna know if they didn't get an award. Well, how many people were actually encouraged at the end of the day? So will any similar stats be released, such as the 42 and the 11 billion? And then one of the other things in the prior round was there was a little bit more of an indication in terms of how the different areas of the, the application is weighted. And maybe I missed it somewhere along the way, but it wasn't made super clear, you know, kind of what the weighting was before the different categories. So I don't know if that ever is going to be intended to be published, but I think any of those facts that you can share, people in the industry that are making these investments and creating these jobs that you're so very interested in, they're hungry for that. And so it would be very welcome and appreciated. Yeah, and I'll take the first, the first part of that in terms of once Treasury finalizes the notifications to all the um, to all the awardees who will be awarded the opportunity to certify the project in its tax um, a little bit different than normal DOE, we will be able to share only information. We will not be able to point to specific projects that uh, gives away tax identifiable information. 
from the DOE and from Treasury. We will be able to release certain stats like the categories of prioritization that uh, we had in the guidance uh, for round one. Um, we will be able to release information as long as, you know, and there, there are rules of thumb around, you know, how many projects within a given sector. If there's only one per, one company in the country who does is a manufacturer in, in with one particular component, we can't say we funded this one because everybody will know it's a company. But as long as Anna is greater than five uh, in any, any particular technology, yes, we will be releasing top line information around investments in different in different type of prioritization. And then round two, we'll point to a modified prioritization after the round one selections. Uh, additionally, uh, the uh, there's still information coming about. It's still the guidance will is not out yet. The, the release of um, the notifications from Treasury, but there is a desire uh, to be able to provide an opportunity for certain industries to be able to raise their hand and, and any private sector in the, in, you know who receives a tax credit, it's in their benefit to raise their hand and say, hey, we received one. They have that right. We cannot release their tax information, but they can. And so you will see following the guide, following the notifications, there will be press releases from companies who want to raise their hand and say, we were successful and we have the tax credit. And so you will see those announcements and individual ones, but then we're working on making sure that um, from Treasury, the Department of Energy, uh, the White House and the LNG, we want to inform as much as we legally can about how well the industry responded in, in, in investing in domestic manufacturing as well as where we're making investments in energy. So all of that to say, we want to give as much information as we legally can. And I think you can read between the lines there as, as how we're going to get on that. And I don't know if Jay can add anything to the scoring, but Jake works on the vertical within MESC that supports the 48C team. I work in the front office. I'm not allowed to see those things. Like I asked the team, I'm like, hey, it'd be really great to see a map of where all these investments went and like how much that $42 billion was shown across the geographic representation. And I was told no. So like it is a very small group within our office. I don't even know if Jake's got to see it. Right. So like the deputy director of the office of the program within his office doesn't get to see that at that level of detail. Just that is how tight this tax information is is valued within this program. So in terms of waiting criteria, um, with as many programs as we have going on, I misspoke in terms of the weighting of community business plans. I think that's where that came from. Um, that was actually for a different program, uh, the, the Clean Energy Monuments that was announced today. Uh, but I will put my statement around we take all four mirror review criteria very seriously. Um, and there's some in, in the past, many applicants have felt like there might be one in which we don't pay attention to. And and we did, you know, there 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 might be a tendency to look at those four wells manufacturing one. We'll take seriously the supply chain. We'll take seriously commercial viability of course, and we'll take seriously the greenhouse gas production. And maybe we don't take the community benefits plan quite as seriously. My message is no, we take it seriously. That that was my message. I just spoke about the exact way um, as a as an initial condition, consider them all and you know, four times twenty-five. And just one quick addition, I really like the comments that Brian and Zach both made, um, and I want to make sure Zach's comments land the right way with the audience. So I think safeguarding the information with the department is a microcosm of how seriously we're running this progress to safeguard the federal tax information of all applicants, right? So we take that very seriously, but that's balanced by, I mean, I want to even say counterbalanced by, it's the balance to like Brian's comment that we want to be able to send the right signals to help the program be a success for the program and for all of you. And so I think we'll continue to strike that balance across both uh, of those desires and outcomes uh, looking ahead around. 
Thank you uh, for the opportunity and also having this forum today as well. And um, I just, uh, and this is probably more of an observation and a comment uh, based on what I've heard thus far as the, uh, what you guys are presenting. And I think was kind of brought up a few, a few times, you know, especially what is the real definition? And I understand that you made a comment about this law where you say energy communities. And for me, uh, I represent a community on the Navajo Nation it's called Black Mesa. And that is on the uh, Navajo Nation that has its own jurisdictions as well. And one of the things I hope I talk to people sometimes is that, you know, rural America versus Indian country uh, rule is totally different from each other. At least rural America has some type of a uh, infra infrastructure in place. So for us, energy community within their area, we are trying to have a, that basic infrastructure put in place. So for energy communities like us, it's really hard to fathom that, that, that the lady I indicated earlier. We can't even fathom, yes, we dream about having these factories or plants to be in place. Yes, we want that, but we don't have that basic infrastructure in place. So it seems like this particular uh, process that was put in place it seems like it's going to be totally um, disqualified, even if we apply, even though within the criteria number four, because we work with the, our, our communities and, you know, criteria four, I know that's, that's where we fit in. We can do that really well. We've done that. And, you know, but the other three, there's no way we can do that. And you guys talk about cost share. There's no way we can even do that at all. And there's no way we, we can even come up with that. There's no way we can do that. And that is so, that seems like this is more geared towards uh, people that have already have some type of infrastructure in place. And, but us energy communities like us that are just trying to get that basic so that that way we can create jobs for our people and also that big vision that we want. But it seems like that's, that's a little barrier because, you know, we, we, uh, we, uh, I, I work with a lot of barriers and I have to work a lot with uh, uh, environmental justice related community as well. And we talk a lot about barriers. And so, yeah, that seems like that a lot of it, it seems that that sector, that energy communities that have that basic infrastructure in place, it seems like they're not even qualified at all. So that's just my observation. I'm not sure that house that's going to be addressed or if it's, or if it's ever going to be addressed. So I just want to make that comment. No, I, I absolutely appreciate and, and resonate with that, that comment. And that's why the interagency working group, you know, we're, we're not just the DOE um, from that perspective. And we want to work with you. We have our four corners rapid response team, which is led out of the Department of Energy, actually out of Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, is a convening group to bring together all of the other agencies. And so I, you know, I know that uh, you know, the Department of Interior, we want to make sure they're at the table, uh, but also uh, we have a lot of programs in, in many of the other agencies to make sure that we can build the appropriate water infrastructure. I know, I know that water in, uh, uh, in your area is a big challenge, um, as well as um, the expansion of broadband, electrification in some places. Um, and Black Mesa is part of our region and is supported by the rapid response team. So don't leave today without getting connected uh, to them. Um, we have a navigator function as well for any community that isn't served directly by a, a rapid response team. We have a navigator function. Our navigator is right here at Ken Barzi. Um, so you can, you can directly connect with Ken and we can try to bring those other types of reasons that might not be addressed by 48 c um, but I completely understand this is really about industrial, it's really focused on, on the industrial manufacturing sector, um, but we, we don't want you to be without making the connections to our rapid response team uh, as well. And that goes for, uh, for any in the room. And uh, to that end, in, in uh, northeastern, uh, or northeastern Arizona, just a couple of weeks ago, the rapid response team had a, had a summit uh, and we continue those those types of events to make sure that uh, you have direct access to the federal resources. And then one last piece I'll mention is in the Department of Energy Office of Indian Energy, uh, we have an MOU uh, with uh, the Navajo Nation. We're working on an MOU with Hopi uh, and the um, 
the Indian Energy team and you know potentially some other the team folks uh, will be in uh, at uh, on the Hopi reservation specifically working on the path forward there. I'd love to, love to talk to you and Austin and Indian Energy uh, as well about the opportunities. So uh, again, you know, we we we're open to, to all the various components of uh, redeveloping and, and developing the, the necessary infrastructure all the way through uh, a closed, you know, gigawatt coal plant. And so, uh, I'm getting the run of time, and, and uh, we were the last thing I think standing between you and lunch. So we're going to take a take a break for lunch. If we have uh, that in the back of the room, please do uh, network. Remember the hands that were raised in the, in the morning. Please do find uh, some folks to network with. And we'll be taking a break uh, until when? Until 12.30. Thank you all.